So from the very minute that I was born, I have been a traveler. My dad was a naval aviator, so I lived the typical life of a Navy brat. Now, I'm not sure where that title came from, but I remember its use vividly. So I traveled extensively up and down the West Coast as a young child. And that travel then um, continued overseas when my dad quit the Navy after we went through a whole round of shots because we were, were going to Guam. Anyone in that situation as a kid? You know, you get all your shots and then your dad quits. You know, what's that about? Anyway, we got to go to England, which was a wonderful thing, and we explored some new opportunities. And while I know that a 10 to 12-year-old cannot fully appreciate the benefits and the opportunities of traveling extensively through Europe and South Africa in the late 60s, I do have really great memories of the British school system and the hospitality of the business people um, who were related to my dad's businesses. They were, they were meaningful uh, to me. Now, we moved every year, at least once, throughout my life. And it wasn't until I became a United Methodist pastor that I started staying put longer than that. Who would have thought that the itineracy would mean stability? But I understand in a unique way what it means to be a traveler, an outsider, visiting new places and adjusting to customs and cultures outside of my own experience. And I have been blessed and enriched by those experiences. And that includes the times when my bishop called me to new places of ministry, places that have been extraordinarily welcoming and life-giving, while at the same time demanding learning and adjusting and developing community over time and through a wide variety of experiences. Not one of the churches that I have served has been exactly like any other. And as members of a relatively new United Methodist Church, all of us in this room have been travelers in our faith journeys. And we have a wide variety of experiences in those journeys. Some feeling instant acceptance and welcome, others having to work harder for that. We've been insiders and we've been outsiders in those travels that we call our faith journeys. And in reading and hearing our scripture story, we discover that the disciples have experienced the exact same thing. In their travels, though, I think two things particularly stick out. First is this power that's given them to heal and to cast out demons and to have power over the enemy. That's one. The second is the power to work together and to rely on the hospitality of others. And I had to ask, what do you think is the greater of the gifts that Jesus gave to his disciples? And isn't it really the latter? The power to work together and to rely on the hospitality of others? Two things happen in our story. First, the disciples go out in teams. And second, they're instructed to take nothing with them, and so they have to rely on the generosity and hospitality of others. Now, the team part, I get. I mean, Jesus is sending them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and he anticipates resistance. <laughs> well, little wonder. I mean, from the very beginning, he said that he's come to set those who society deemed criminals free, to heal those who had been cast aside, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in an empire that worshiped Caesar as Lord. So Jesus knows that there are going to be plenty of folks who are going to resist this message, whether it's from fear or disbelief or even self-interest. Because when the powers of the world are challenged, friends, all kinds of people and things get upset. And so Jesus sends them out in pairs. So when one falters, the other can help. When one is lost, the other can seek the way. 
When one is discouraged, the other can hold the faith for both for a little while. And that's what the company of believers does. We hold on to each other. We console each other. We encourage and embolden each other. And sometimes we even believe for each other. But we tend to forget that. Because we live in this culture that insists that it's all up to us as individuals. You know, you only have one chance to get it right. And there's just not enough for everyone. So we've been taught to look out for number one. And that the one with the most toys wins. So Jesus' reminder that we find success only with and for each other is both a timely gift for his disciples then and for us now. Then he also commands that they take nothing with them. Anyone here ever gone on a trip and taken absolutely nothing? That's foreign to us, isn't it? I mean, that means that the disciples, far more than the usual 12 we think about, there are 72 in this particular passage, they have to depend on the generosity of others for their meals, for a place to stay, well, for just about everything. How many of us find that kind of dependence a little uncomfortable? It makes us feel like we're not prepared, maybe unsafe, and definitely, definitely vulnerable. But isn't that really the point? We are vulnerable. And we forget that too, going to great lengths to manufacture and perpetuate illusions of control and independence and invulnerability. But any illness, any loss or death or disappointment or tragedy reminds us painfully just how incredibly vulnerable we are. And so Jesus sends his disciples out in pairs and instructs them to rely entirely upon the hospitality of others. We might ask why. And I think it's simply because we are stronger when we stay together. And our welfare is absolutely linked to that of each other. As John Donne wrote in that famous poem, No man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thine own or of thine friends were, each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind." Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. In the United States, we recently celebrated Independence Day, a tribute not just to our independence from Great Britain, but also to the spirit of American individualism. Yet the individualism that we celebrate is as much a myth of the culture as is our invulnerability. Because the pilgrims and the pioneers who settled this land were incredibly aware that their survival depended upon each other. The colonies that they eventually established, after all, were called commonwealths, places where the good of any individual individual was inextricably linked to the good of the whole. And as Benjamin Franklin said at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, we must hang together or assuredly we will all hang separately. (laughs) So how do we do this kind of work together? The story of Jesus' sending of the 72 gives a rare window to us into what it meant to follow Jesus in that first generation. And so Jesus sends out his disciples with this first proclamation that sounds deceptively simple, but probably we've puzzled every time we've read it. Whatever house you enter, 
first say, peace to this house. And how many of you, when you go to a home, that's the first thing you say? Not common for us today, is it? This word of peace, though, is the first word, the opening word, the announcing word that Jesus commends to his disciples. Now notice that Jesus does not tell them to do any sort of assessment before making that proclamation. He doesn't ask them to determine whether this house follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or whether this house has kept the law, or whether this house is likely to receive the good news that Jesus brings. Jesus doesn't ask them to do any kind of risk assessment or prejudge whether or not this house will be worth their time. And Jesus goes on then to instruct them the dynamics of sharing peace. So here's the aha for us. If anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Now that's really instructive for those of us who tend to live a little bit more reactively in our world today. It's worth taking a little time to unpack because Jesus first assumes that these apostles, these disciples that he sends do in fact have something that he labels peace. And Jesus says that your peace specifically, not just random or generic peace, but your peace peace will rest on others or it will come right back to you. So a question to frame that might be, how are you doing at the dynamic of sharing peace? In the midst of changing times all around you, how is it with your soul? Because as you engage others, and not just in the church, but we're talking everywhere you interface with other people, you need to be well grounded in God's peace, this peace that passes understanding. You see, God's shalom is more than just being calm or peaceful. It's even more than the wonderful song that we sing at the end of our worship time. It's this confidence in God's abiding presence so that you then share that presence with others. And engaging others means not treating them as objects upon which you act or feel sympathy or provide charity even, but as sacred others with whom you are called to be fully and peacefully present. And if they don't share that peace, that willingness to simply be present and listen and share, then Jesus doesn't say you need to react to that with scorn and judgment. Instead, he just simply reassures his followers that their peace is not diminished. Their peace can't be taken away from them. It will return to you. So how is the peace in your soul? And are you at peace with your brothers and sisters here at Desert Skies? And at the end of that question to his disciples, and only then, you know, can, can you maintain without reacting? Can you just be God's presence and God's love in the world? Then and only then, Jesus instructs them with their second proclamation. Well, then the kingdom of God has come near you. And remarkably, that proclamation applies whether one is welcomed or one is not welcomed. The kingdom of God, you see, is promised to all, to those who receive as well as to those who reject. And this new kinship, this new way of understanding all human relationships, indeed God's ordering of all things, that is a life-changing proclamation because God says the kingdom of God is near for everyone. We just want to invite you into that experience. There are no insiders or outsiders. And here again, Jesus does not instruct them to argue, to convince, to complain, or to threaten. 
if they're not welcomed. Now, he does advise them to signal that they're just going to move on and not let someone get to them by shaking dust off their shoes because in that way, they're not weighted down by rejection or paralyzed with trying to figure out what they did wrong or they could have done differently to produce a different outcome. Instead, Jesus just invites them to move forward in the confidence of these two proclamations. Peace to this house. In other words, I'm here. God's presence just wants to be present with you and with me in our conversations. And the kingdom of God has come near because those conversations are available and open to all people. And as Christians, I think we can reliably root all of our lives in those two proclamations. Peace to this house and the kingdom of God is near. And that's the good news that we have to share. These keep our gaze on God's activity that's going on right in front of us, rather than turning it into blaming and accusing or judgmental analyzing symptoms that reactivity holds our lives in bondage. So when I find myself blaming or accusing or being somewhat judgmental, I have to think, why am I being so reactive in a situation? Because, you know, God's on my side and God's on their side. And God's just working to try to get us into communication with one another. There is so much good going on in the world. There is so much go good going on right here in this place that we need to celebrate and remember that we're a part of this amazing community, that every single member is important and valued, no matter what road we have traveled or what road we are traveling on in the present. In the African-American community, now I was privileged to serve as a pastor in an African-American church for a year while I was a district superintendent, and talk about culture difference. But they had this song that they sang called, I Need You to Survive. And in this church, this song could go on anywhere from five minutes to 20, depending on the Holy Spirit and how it was working in their lives. But the words went, I need you, you need me, we're all a part of God's body. Stand with me, come be with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is God's will that every need be supplied you are important to me. I need you to survive. And then they sang that line about 20 million times. You're important to me. I need you to survive. Desert skies, I need you. You need me. We're all apart of God's body, a community of shalom with a diversity of opinions, of backgrounds, and faith journeys. We will not always agree with one another, but we can always love one another and do the work of bringing joyful community to all, drawing them to Christ. Because as St. Teresa of Avila once said, Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which the compassion of Christ looks out to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless others now. All of which is why I believe that of the gifts Jesus gave to his disciples, the greater may just be that of teamwork and trusting obedience. Because when we love one another in caring community, a prime component of our mission statement, it's up there, one of our core values, when we recall that God said it is not good for us to be alone, when we see our hope and welfare as totally linked to that of those around us, then we can not only accomplish more, far more than we can possibly do alone, we also discover that our names, along with those first disciples, are written in the book of heaven. 
And all God's people said, Amen. I invite us now to enter into a time of prayer and reflection.